Welcome to another episode of Something Came From Baltimore. My name is Tom Gowker, and tonight I get to chat with Paula Atherton. Paula Atherton is a musician's musician. She has been in the game for over 20 years, and she just achieved her first number one record, the single, Can You Feel It? Paula is a working musician in the NYC area. She's a vocalist, she's a saxophonist, and she plays the flute. And she is a, a wonderful music producer, as you're going to hear in her latest recording, also titled, Can You Feel It? Can You Feel It? is a journal. It's a notebook of different sounds. And we get to learn more about the album and Paula Atherton right after we listen to this track from the album called Funkified. Paula Atherton, welcome to Something Came From Baltimore. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, you're welcome. Hey, I'm excited for you because your latest recording is called Can You Feel It? It was released in September 8th, 2020 on the Dream One Records. And this is the breakout. This is the one with the big number one hit, Can You Feel It? It must feel good to finally get that number one spot. Yeah, I mean, you know, just picture this. It's my first number one and COVID is happening. All my work is canceled. I can't tour. You know, it's just like, I don't even know how to describe it. I mean, when I found out that it happened, I opened my front door and I screamed, you know, but uh, that's about all I could do. Um, without being able to go out and play a show and celebrate it, it, it just feels, don't get me wrong, it's, either way, it's great, you know, either way. No, no one's gonna like turn down something like that. It's, it's um, it's something that's really special, and I mean, it's not the reason why we create music, but it certainly is like a nod. You know, it's like, you know, what you're doing is not just going out into a black hole in the universe, and you know, people like are receiving your music and they like it. And they're telling you that it makes them happy, and you know it's just a it's a it's a wonderful thing. The elephant in the room is that you know the formats have changed, and the radio stations have changed, and the ability to reach out to people has you know obviously changed, and you're you know kind of fighting for that acceptance where you you would have had it already. That's I think probably the most frustrating part. I can't necessarily agree with that. Um, and this is not something that you would be cognizant of because you're a guy. Women are not promoted the same way men are. It's just not an even playing field. Yeah, you know what? I didn't even think of that. I didn't think of that. I looked at the quality of music and I'm like, okay, what I like about this album is it's the attention to detail. Now, it looks like you had your hand in production on all these songs. They're, the album is worthy to put a headset on because you have a lot of things going on in these songs and uh, the sliding bass guitars or, or their uh, um, an, an acoustic or electric guitar doing something on the, in the back end it's it's really interesting i love your singing i think that you have a potential of being a blues artist in the future if you ever want to go in that direction too i started as a singer uh, i've been singing longer than i've been playing and even a lot of my instrumental songs are actually vocal tunes that I wrote that I'm playing instrumentally. Um, you can't get that many vocals played in this format. They maybe play, I don't know what the ratio is these days, but for a while it was like one per hour. So if you're trying to get spins to get up the chart, that's not going to help you. Your, your first album came out in the year 2000. and 2018, Dave Kaz, like uh, promoted you as like an artist to know tag, an artist to watch. Uh, was that frustrating at all that, that you were kind of in the biz for 18 years and you're still like an artist to watch? You know, you always, um, you know, you, you love to have those sort of things happen. It's, it's really nice. I would do what I'm doing anyway, no matter what. You know, having the genre accept me more, it makes it easier for me, you know. I mean, I, I come from the straight-ahead world, you know, and I still do 
a gift run playing standards in a, a duo trio setting or maybe sometimes quartet, uh, you know, songs from the American Songbook. This whole career that I had, this recording career, came about from me writing because I wanted to make something that was uh, uniquely mine. There's so many people, especially, you know, playing standards and, and that sort of repertoire. I like doing that and, and it's and it's fun, and I'll always do it, especially in New York, there's a big call for it. Being able to write and have my own recording is my own fingerprint. In that way, I can combine all the different types of music that I like, you know, old school R&B, funk, flat music, pop music, you know, all different types of music, and I, and I think maybe you can hear the elements of that, of those different types of uh, genres in my writing. Well, I'm listening to your voice, and I, I'm sure you've had this uh, comparison already. That there's a, a an essence of um, Tina Marie, and I hear an essence of Diana Ross in there. Has, is this anything new that you've heard before? Diana Ross, I have not. Tina Marie, I hear all the time. Yeah, yeah, you definitely have the <laughs> Tina Marie. <laughs> I the ballad piece of Diana Ross. Uh, some of that, the tones when she does a ballad, I, I can hear a little in, in yours, but you're definitely Tina oriented, which is in my mind, a super, super compliment. She is fantastic. And I definitely love listening to her. Yeah. People have asked me, why don't you do a Tina Marie, uh, tribute band? <laughs> so, well, I got, I got six, uh, recordings out, you know, six releases out. I got, that's kind of like enough of my own music, but, uh, that might be fun. Oh yeah. You know, I was raised in the Philly market and, WDAS played Tina Marie. They still do on a like one Tina Marie song every two hours. Like they just won't let her alone, and that's good. I mean, because I was a little too young when she started out, and when you know I, I learned about her all through the eighties and nineties. I'm actually not familiar with that much of her material, of course, and Square Biz and uh, Love a Girl. T take an <laughs> anthology and dig in there. I, I think that Casanova Brown uh, is is something really good and. Just because I All right, so let's get into the album. Let's do this. What we do is we go through five songs I had listed that I was hoping that maybe you talk about a little. in Madrid. Again, I, I praise the production of this. I think at the attention to detail. Now that I know that Bill was from the Rippingtons, I can I do feel a little Rippington vibe. But I also, I just love a flute. A flute and jazz is fantastic. And I like how you started the whole album with this song. I think it's pretty cool. Oh, thanks. You know, um, it's kind of like a lost art sequencing a record, you know, because a lot of people just do streaming or get a single or whatever. But for those who, who are actually interested in getting like a full album and looking at the jacket and the credits and all that kind of stuff and listen to it from beginning to end, just in case some people want to do that, you have to kind of think about, you know, the sequencing of the music. I'm the person that usually sequences the album. And I kind of think of it as if it were set list when I was doing a show. You want to keep people's attention, so you kind of have to have, like, peaks and valleys, you know, you, you have something slow, and then you, you follow it with something, like, really upbeat, and just, you know, keep it moving like that, and, and, and mix it up, and that, I think, helps hold the uh, listener's interest. Is this an opportunity as a... I usually speak to my radio guy about that, and uh, go with what he thinks. <laughs> as far as, like, my brand goes, I'm pretty much usually follow the saxophone player. From my standpoint, in my brain, when I write something, I hear it either being a vocal tune, a flute tune, or a sax tune. So me, I, I could go any way with it. But, um, you know, sometimes they like to brand people in a certain way. And I, we, we have another single coming out. It's going to be in February, but for some reason, Just Can't Stop, which is the current single, just got added to two more stations, and it was getting towards the end of the campaign. Sirius XM just added it last week.
the song I wanted to talk about was the Patrice Russian song, the Forget Me Not. You you worked with Gerald Albright before. Gerald Albright did the sax solo originally, and you chose not to go and uh, duplicate that. You did your own sax solo. It's great. I wouldn't take anything away from it. I just, you know, as improvising musicians, we just try to make our own thing, especially in this environment where there's all these, like, tribute bands and that sort of thing. Uh, I think it's really important to have your own sound and have your own way that you play, you know? So if I'm going to do a cover tune, which I don't do a lot of, I got to make it my own. I don't just play it, you know. I don't just play a tune, a cover tune. I, I, you know, I have to make it my own, and I had to have recorded it already, and you know, I had to put my own uh, thing on it. The next song was "Calling You," which is the power ballad on the album, and this is where I was like, this is like a reminiscence of like Patti Labelle and the. Uh, late 70s early 80s or diana ross palette and i even thought of like the dramatics or the dells a little the the way that the song structure is it, and it builds up it's a really good song my heart is aching i can't see the light your love is guiding me when i am lost i have your love to hold on I had written that before COVID, and it was about being on the road and being lonely. And and this album was starting to have a theme, a thread through it of travel <laughs> until I got quarantined. Um, you know, it was like one night in Madrid, twenty miles to nowhere, and uh, and calling you. It wasn't completed by the time COVID started, but I the, the uh, recording did get finished this year. When I when I released uh, the first single, Can You Feel It, in January, the album was not even near being done. And as you said before, it got released in September. So I used that time in between to, to finish it. All right. The next song I want to talk about is In the Pocket. Great percussion going on. You got a slide bass. You got the JB horns. It looks like you have a like a Hammond organ or, or an organ itself. Some great guitar work there. The detail is just amazing. And I was curious, your sax, did you double that up on this song? <laughs> Thank you. 
Um, I sometimes, I'm not recalling exactly what we did on that phone, but a lot of times I'll double, sometimes I double the, the melody and then I'll do it in octave down. Uh, it just makes it, and then you mix it, um, you know, not that loud, but just the essence of it there it makes it sound really fast. Yeah, that was, um, that's one of, um, Greg Manning's, uh, the techniques. And, uh, you know, since then I've been kind of, I did that on other tracks and it's a really cool way to sing. And it just, uh, it, like you said, yeah, it makes, it makes the horn sound fat and, um, I, I just think it's a great technique. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you just can't really get that all the time. Like that's not a sound you normally make. And it's just, it's just, uh, becomes a whole new instrument it's a it has a great sound quality to it oh thank you yeah he um greg nanning uh wrote that with me and he produced it so um what we did in the production was definitely uh directed by him do you teach you said you had something at seven o'clock tonight i uh i have some students that i teach privately and i'm part of the f2f uh, foundation in Houston, and we uh, we raise money to get instruments to kids whose families can't afford them. And sometimes, when I'm playing in the city, I'll, I'll go and uh, to a local school and I'll do a workshop there. At SDF, we became aware of this uh, student in Houston who was playing trombone. He was 11. And his family could no longer afford to keep renting it for him. He was really distraught. We found out about it. He agreed to donate a trombone. So uh, they had a whole ceremony online on Zoom that I was able to watch uh, in Houston with Malachi getting his trombone. And his pastor was there blessing the trombone. And uh, <laughs> I was watching and they're like, is this what that is can you Can you say a few words? I was like, I'm so happy for Malachi. <laughs> I couldn't keep it together right at all. I said, I'm really sorry. I'm a mess over here. I'm, you know, I'm so happy that he's getting it. And, uh, I mean, I just love, I love doing stuff like that. And I, and I just, I just love that sort of thing. Chronically, it's just, it's the right thing to do, but that's not why I do it. I just do it because I love to do it. Paula Atherton, I really appreciate you talking to me today on Something Came From Baltimore. My pleasure. I hope you enjoyed the interview today on Something Came From Baltimore with Paula Atherton. If you're listening to the show on TheBox.com, you don't have to wait to hear the next interview. Just subscribe to Something Came From Baltimore, the podcast. It can be heard on every platform except for Spotify because we play music here. Subscribe and flip it to five people who love this kind of music. And then ask them to be a part of that Be More Music scene. 